Good evening, everyone. My name is Kim Rubenstein, and I'm absolutely delighted to, to welcome you all from wherever you're coming. I believe we have people all around the country, Australia, and I think we might even have people who are living overseas or might even uh, be forced to be um, overseas, and that may be something we come back to later this evening. But I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are each respectively sitting around this beautiful country and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and ground ourselves, I think, uh, at the beginning of this evening in a recognition of how fundamental land is and our environment is to all of us and to connect to that land and be appreciative of that. I felt it was also important at the beginning of this evening to just ground ourselves in the moment of the fact that we're all sitting here during a pandemic in our homes because of that. And um, the somberness, I guess, from reflecting on this past week's events internationally and the heaviness in our hearts about what is happening around the world in Afghanistan, but not only there, around the world in so many different ways. So um, in that context, um, we should all be mindful for the blessings that we do have, those of us um, in safe places, and also to cherish those things that we have. And I think that that is a framework to be um, bringing everybody together this evening to reflect on and think about the opportunities that we all have as um, members of communities to have a role, to play a role in making sure that we make this world a better place and our communities a better place. And so I couldn't think of a better way to launch my announcement of um, wanting to run as an independent to represent the ACT in the parliament by looking to three women who have inspired me and have inspired the country to discuss the role of independence in improving democracy in Australia. And so I have great pleasure in um, introducing um, uh, my panellists and um, starting our conversation this evening. Um, and um, perhaps if I uh, go in the order that I have on my own run sheet rather than physically or uh, framed in whichever way it is for, for you as an, as an audience. Um, I welcome Helen Haynes, MP, the independent member for INDI and has been a Member of Parliament since 2019. Welcome, Helen. Thank you, Kim, and hello, everyone. Fantastic. Um, I welcome Zali Stegel, MP, Independent Member for the for Warringah, who was also elected in 2019. Welcome, Zali. Thank you, Kim. Welcome, everyone. And finally, but last but not least, Dr. Fer Karen Phelps, Phelps, sorry, Karen, um, former independent member for uh, Wentworth from 2018 to 2019, and a wonderful contributor to our society beyond that um, independent role. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Kim, and hello, everyone. Thank you. So what I thought would be um, wonderful to do um, to begin this discussion um, and as I said, each of you have been inspirational to so many of us, is to ask you each to just reflect on what actually did drive you to um, put yourself forward to be a member um, of Parliament, and in particular, what led you to the independent route. And perhaps if I go in the reverse order of my introductions and start with you, Karen, um, if you can start us off on that question. Well, my journey to uh, the by-election in uh, Wentworth in 2018 was an unusual moment in our history. As you all may recall, we had a Prime Minister who was the member at the time, Malcolm Turnbull, and he was deposed from his position and then resigned from Parliament, uh, which meant that there had to be a by-election. And that by-election was to be held within eight months of the next federal election. Uh, and so this was October of 2018. We had to have another federal election by uh, May of 2019. And so uh, I was asked by many people in the community whether I would stand as an independent because there were many people who had traditionally voted Liberal, who were very angry about the way things were going in, uh, in, in Parliament. 
They were angry about what had happened with yet another leadership spill on the back of several others that had happened. They wanted stability, but they also wanted action on climate change. They wanted to see an integrity commission. They wanted to see better treatment of refugees. They wanted to see uh, proper funding and support for our public broadcaster, the ABC. And there were a whole range of, of other issues that, that I was excited about, passionate about, and wanted to uh, be able to contribute to the public debate. I didn't really have an expectation of winning that election, that by-election, uh, but I thought, no, I think this is an opportunity to make a stand, to speak up for those things that I consider are incredibly important. Uh, I had always been an advocate for the health system. Uh, I had for 20 years been an advocate for equality and justice for the LGBTQI community. And, uh, and so, you know, even though it didn't sort of make cognitive sense to stand in a, a seat that had never been won by anyone other than a conservative or a liberal, uh, I proceeded because I felt so strongly about that. And as it turned out, so many members of my community at the time felt very strongly about those things too. And, uh, and we made history by be, be becoming the first independent when I say we make history, it's not just about the candidates, it's about all of the team around you and the community and the people who are prepared to put their faith in you. So that was the initial driving force for me to go into Parliament as an independent. Fantastic. Thank you. Zali, let's move to you. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Look, <clears throat> I guess... One of my driving factors was, I, and I should say, disclose, I met with Karen very early on before I even announced, and I wanted to know, you know, really her, her very personal feeling of what, it, you know, was it worth it? Um, and, you know, what was the experience like? And, and her words were, there is nothing more um, moving. It is such a privilege to be in that chamber and to have the opportunity to debate and influence laws and legislation that will will impact lives of millions of Australians. And so there is no greater privilege. Um, and I very much agree with that. Um, I felt it was really important to come as an independent because I'm a bit disillusioned with all the parties, to be totally frank. Um, I think there is too much behind the scenes wheeling and dealing that happens within the party rooms and the caucus, uh, too many power brokers that happen, the pre-selection process around both sides, you know, from the coalition and the ALP. And to be fair, the Greens as well, you constantly hear of issues in those parties. So I really wanted to give Warringah a different choice, an alternate choice at the 2019 election. Um, I felt strongly on a number of issues. Uh, more women in parliament was one of them. Uh, certainly uh, better policy on climate change that we needed to end the divisiveness. But also um, I felt we really needed to get back to good policy, you know, fact-based debate, no matter what the topic is, you know, a little bit more integrity and anti-corruption and, you know, just bringing it back to actually representing your electorate instead of representing a party. So for me, it was an absolute no-brainer that I would do it as an independent. Um, and as Karen said, as an independent, you are one of a big team. You cannot do it alone. Uh, my name might have been on it, but I was one of many to, you know, it was a wave of support that could make it happen. Um, and for me, that was a really important part. And my goal since being in Canberra has been to, you know, I am only one vote of Warringah. Um, I'm there to represent the people of Warringah. Fantastic. Over to you, Helen. Let's hear that. Oh, thanks, Kim. And um, I feel inspired listening to Karen and Zali and so much of what they say resonates for me. But look, um, firstly, coming from the electorate of Indi, I had a tremendous role model um, in Cathy McGowan who made history here in, in Indi in 2013 when uh, she unseated the incumbent uh, Liberal Party uh, member and uh, really put Indi on the map as, as the maverick seat in 2013. And, and I was part of that movement of, of uh, many, many volunteers, uh, around 600 of us on the ground in the electorate for all those weeks. And part of that enormous celebration when we did what we thought was completely impossible and, and unthinkable. And for me, I got a taste for politics in a way that I had never had before. I think I, I was probably very, um, 
uh, emblematic of many Australians at the time feeling pretty cynical, pretty disappointed in what I was seeing in the federal parliament and not sure how to, to make a change. And uh, I think what we did in India in 2013 changed me as much as it changed the electorate. So uh, when, when Cathy retired in 2019, the question for all of us in Indi, for that big, great big community group of us was, are we prepared to just hand this back to the major parties or are we willing to go another round? And if so, who? And uh, I was the classic person who was looking at everybody else and uh, not actually thinking it should be me. Uh, so again, our community took upon uh, themselves to engage in, in really uh, participating in their democracy by trying to find a way to get another candidate. And I participated in that. And in doing that, I knew that if I was willing to throw my hat in the ring, then I would have to take up the challenge if the community asked me to do so. And from that moment, really, um, I felt the great big thrill of being part of an election campaign as a candidate. The fear, uh, the fear many, many days, but also the courage of having then 1,700 people behind me, supporting me, putting their faith in me and, and wearing out their boot leather. Um, for me, it would only ever be to run as an independent, uh, like like um, Zali and Karen. The the party machine doesn't work for me. I don't think it worked for Indi. That's why we we turned independent. We liked what we saw. Uh, we understood that you could get things done. And for me, every day I get out of bed, I know who I work for. I work for the people of Indi. I'm so proud to do that. Every time the speaker calls my name, the member for Indi has the call. I have a thrill. Of, uh, of that extraordinary privilege and responsibility of being a member of the House of Representatives. So now that I'm here, um, it, uh, it's indeed uh, worth the effort. By golly, it is. Fantastic. Well, I think um, just in my own experience in terms of encouraging fellow citizens to think about their roles, just listening to each of you now um, adds that further, I think, um, emphasis to the capacity that we all, all Australians have to think about their contributions and then this being a, a particular step in terms of going into the House um, or into Parliament or from, in my case looking to the Senate. But I thought I would ask from that um, start if we, if we could think about the policy issues that have been particularly important for each of you um, and the ways in which you as an independent have a different way of engaging with of the policies. And perhaps that sort of draws a little bit um, from what you said, Zali, about the frustration with the parties and the way the parties have been dealing with different um, policy issues. Um, and maybe if we start again doing the reverse, so we'll start with you again, Helen, in terms of the, um, the work that you've been doing around anti-corruption, and maybe that might be a good... Um, beginning to start thinking about both that policy and what your role as an independent has been able to do in that particular area. Yeah, thanks, Kim. And, and uh, look, it is, uh, it, it's like the signature dish of Indi um, fighting for a Federal Integrity Commission. It was what uh, motivated our electorate in the first place was our disillusionment, our lack of trust, our, our sense of disengagement from our democracy. And that was deeply embedded in these issues that we saw taking place in the federal parliament where uh, taxpayers' money did not appear to be going to the places of need, uh, where we saw the behaviour of parliamentarians not really meeting the SNP test by any general standards of good behaviour. Um, it was those things that made us really rise up and uh, try to claim our democracy in our own electorate. So for me, it was an absolute given that I would stand on the shoulders of the giants that went before me and continue the work in uh, calling for, and not just calling for, but putting forward a solution for this long-standing <coughs> issue of a Federal Integrity Commission. And it's been, uh, the conversation has been going for over two decades and still we don't have one. On the 8th of September, it'll be 1,000 days since the Prime Minister promised a Federal Integrity Commission. So for me, I work uh, very closely with the, the people of Indi. They engage with me. Uh, we decided uh, right at the beginning of my term as a member for Indi to, to embed the work that I was doing on a set of key principles that people would understand around integri an integrity commission and uh, connect it to a story in our, our electorate that made sense. And that, and that was the Beechworth principles and the story of a gold digger um, who had not 
found the justice that he deserved because of a corrupt uh, a corrupt government. So, you know, in, in just a short period of time, I called on the people of Indi to join me in, a, in an old courthouse in Beechworth. And within the flick of a switch, we had so many people in that courthouse wanting to talk about the Beechworth principles and committing to me to work with me to make this happen. We then... Uh, we then had the COVID lockdown, but we still managed to, to send a petition around the whole electorate and get thousands of names on that and take it to the parliament. And from there, I've worked very closely building on the work that went before me from the Greens, from, from Cathy McGowan's bill, from all the recommendations of multiple Senate inquiries, and then introduced to the parliament um, the Australian Federal Integrity Commission Bill 2020 and its sister bill, the uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Standards Bill, which of course, uh, has a, a parliamentary code of conduct, something that uh, is sorely lacking in the parliament. And every time the community works with me, they put out, they funded themselves a series of advertisements in major newspapers and local uh, rural newspapers across the nation, calling on other Australians to get behind Helen Haynes, independent member for Indi and uh, bring on an integrity commission. So it's an important piece of work and I won't give up on it. I'm very determined. Fantastic. We might come back to some of those things in terms of how you'll you'll get it through. Maybe Zali, if we move to you with your climate change work, if you could tell us a little bit about that and and your role as an independent in particular. Thanks, Kim. Look, I think there's so many policy areas where we actually need to do better in terms of having actually you know merit based fact based policy and really understanding the case for the legislation and who it is intended to help and what it's going to do and if there's an area of policy that Australia has failed on it's been climate change policy and our transition uh, to low emission technologies and it's been weaponized it was highly uh, weaponized by the previous member for Ringa I mean we do have a responsibility there um, in terms of uh, you know, the last time we had bipartisan agreement on climate change was uh, Kevin Rudd and John Howard in 2007. Uh, after that, it, uh, it cost Malcolm Turnbull the leadership of the Liberal Party. Tony Abbott brought that about. And ever since then, uh, action on climate change has just been uh, weaponised in the sense that a huge amount of misinformation has been uh, distributed to create fear, fear of change and opportunity. Um, and uh, it, it's become so incredibly dysfunctional as an area. So my goal was to actually put forward something sensible. It is not the most ambitious from an environmental or climate point of view, but it is very much a sensible framework which gives us the building blocks to actually progress and be leaders in this field. And it's a proven formula. I'm not reinventing the wheel. This is legislation modelled on what was passed in the UK in 2008, to give you an idea of how far behind we are, um, and, and it very much has broad support. Because so the climate change bills, I introduced them in November. Like Helen, look, COVID has definitely played havoc with our scheduling. But interestingly enough, the COVID pandemic hasn't shut down the debate on climate. It has actually elevated it because it's made us all the more aware of we are part of a global world. Um, what happens globally will impact all of us and climate impacts will not discriminate on, on national borders. It will impact everywhere. So I introduced the climate change bills and I put them to inquiry because I feel in Australia, we only ever debate climate, you know, emissions reduction ambition and climate change policy every three years at elections. And then it gets incredibly lost in all the different issues that are up for debate at an election. And it gets incredibly lost in the fear and smear that you get in the election campaigning. Um, and so people then don't have a clear view of what is the pathway. And so what the inquiry showed was there is unanimous support from the business community, industry, investment, planning, architects, the unions, uh, the Australian Medical Association, you know, the only two organisations essentially that don't support legislating the climate change bills are the Minerals Council, probably hardly surprising, um, and the National Farmers Association, who despite being committed to a net zero by 2050 target, essentially don't want to offend the Nationals MPs by supporting this legislation. So it's really important to show everyone that you can have uh, you can bring consensus to the par parliament um, about what is our pathway forward. And, you know, the prime minister has often said, 
uh, Australians, we won't be told by the international community what our domestic policy should be. And so the inquiry was to show the Prime Minister and the coalition government that what industry wants, what business wants, what the overwhelming majority of the population wants is clear, sensible policy to transition to net zero. Um, and so, look, unfortunately, coalition MPs are still digging their heels. They are playing the political line. They want to have a political football about this for yet longer, despite the warnings that we had this week with the IPCC yeah. report. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it will come down to independence. You know, yeah. it is Helen and I and Rebecca and the crossbench that are pushing climate to the front of our debate. The major parties are caught with their donations, the fossil fuel lobby, coal and gas still plays way too big an influence on major party policies. Well, okay, that's really absolutely fascinating. And I'll come back to all of you to think about the role of the Senate in relation to what you're doing in the lower house in terms of the crossbench. But before we do that, Karen, I'd really like to hear from you too about the, that period that you had where you really did as an independent have such a force. Well, when I campaigned for the by-election in Wentworth in 2018, as I mentioned, there were a number of really key issues that I felt needed attention. And you've heard about two of those from Helen and from Zali, and they are doing just an amazing job of keeping those issues, the Integrity Commission and climate action, the climate action legislation, very much at the forefront of people's minds and just not letting them get away with pushing it into the background. Uh, and so I think that, again, is one of the great uh, functions of an independent to be able to push forward without uh, party politics suppressing or silencing the voices that need to be heard uh, from within the party. And so independents can, can speak on behalf of their community on issues that are really important. So I came to Parliament with uh, a mandate from the community for a range of issues to fight for those, to speak for those. When you come into Parliament, you are visited by a number of groups, the lobbyists, advocates, activists, with their particular issues. And one of the issues that I felt had the greatest urgency for me as a doctor, uh, as a humanitarian, and uh, as a human being, was the way Australia had been treating refugees and people seeking asylum. And one of the questions that I asked the advocates in those early weeks when I came to Parliament was, what is something that is most urgent that we need to achieve that is uh, something that, that would make a really substantial difference to the well-being of the sector? And they said, if we could somehow cut through the bureaucratic red tape that is keeping people trapped, uh, who are unwell, who can't get the medical treatment that they need, in indefinite offshore detention, that would make a huge difference. So what I did was, was to, to look at the principles of remote healthcare in Australia and think, well, how can we put into place legislation that will mirror what we already practice for Australians and apply that to people who are under Australia's care, so-called care, in detention in Manus Island and Nauru. And so, as, as a, a joint effort with the refugee advocacy sector, uh, with the entire crossbench, almost the entire crossbench, and the ALP, we set about drafting legislation that would achieve a very specific objective, and that was to take the medical decisions out of the hands of bureaucrats and politicians and put the decisions in medical hands. And so was born the medical of, uh, the, the medical evacuation bill became known as the Medivac bill. And it had the support. We, uh, one, once we negotiated some of the issues that were an issue around national security and other things with, uh, with the ALP, uh, we negotiated with the Greens, of course, and, um, and the other crossbenchers. And, and I think we came together with a piece of beautifully drafted legislation that did exactly what it was intended to do and saved quite possibly hundreds of lives. Mm. Well, wow. I mean, the, I think um, the attention um, of the community generally to each of these issues is just without a doubt. And so having that, the force of each of you on, on those issues in the House has been so significant. Can you reflect a little on the role of the Senate and the crossbench there to the extent that having those um, and what I'm hoping to be another independent voice in the Senate would 
would do um, in your minds just briefly? Um, maybe back to you, Karen. Well, I can talk about the, the Medi Medivac legislation yes. because uh, when you're in the, the House of Reps, it, it's quite difficult to get your legislation onto the agenda. And here we had a piece of legislation that the government did not want passed. It didn't want it heard. And so what we had to do is to find a way to get it onto the legislative agenda. And so we needed an independent senator uh, to put that forward in the Senate. So it then came from the Senate back to the House. And so um, Tim Storer actually said, I'll put this forward. And, and we thought, well, how do we do this? There was a piece of legislation uh, being debated in the Senate, which was a Home, home Affairs Amendment brackets miscellaneous bill mm -hmm. and it was because it was miscellaneous that we were actually able to vault the Medivac legislation onto that in the Senate, have it introduced as an amendment. We had the numbers to pass it because we had independents who were prepared to support it and the ALP in the Senate and the Greens mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it passed and then it went back to the House uh, but because there was filibustering in the Senate by uh, a couple of in independents at the time, it was held up getting back to the house and so yeah. the house closed for the Christmas break. It was right on the last day. That's right. And so we then had to wait until we came back after the Christmas break and then it went into, this, into the House of Reps first day back and it was, it was passed by the narrowest of margins. Yeah. So the fact that we had independence on the crossbench, yeah. we had independence and crossbenchers in the Senate who were prepared to support this humanitarian bill that was just so important, uh, I think, to the soul of Australia, that we were able to get that legislation through. Without independence, it wouldn't have been drafted, it wouldn't have been passed. Fantastic, it's very interesting. Helen, is there anything that you would share at the moment in relation to the relationship of the independence in the House and in the Senate? Oh, look, I think uh, Karen's example of Medivac, again, it, it's uh, spine tingling. I remember that so very well, Karen, and, mm -hmm. and I remember reflecting on exactly that point. If it were not for the independence in both the House and the Senate, that could not have happened. And I think what you illustrate is, is the capacity for an independent to work across the aisles, to work across the houses, um, to take an issue on its merit and to do the work, um, to do the drafting, to work in collaboration with people, find what it is that you align on and then uh, navigate and negotiate to get a bill through. And look, Karen has, has highlighted it is incredibly difficult because the government of the day hold the agenda. Uh, so it's extraordinarily difficult and it takes, uh, it takes an enormous amount of work to find those people and, uh, and to work together with them. But if you have an issue that's important enough, um, then it's extraordinary what you can do. Um, but it's, it, is, it isn't a miracle. It, it actually it can only really happen if you've got people in, those, in the Senate and in the House of Representatives who are there to do the work of the people rather than to do the work of the party. And uh, I think uh, the Medivac bill is a beautiful illustration. I'm working very closely right now um, with my Senate colleagues on integrity as well, because there are many people in the Senate who want to see this uh, legislation passed as well as me. Fantastic. Sally, mm -hmm. is there anything you'd like to add on that? Oh, I agree, absolutely. It's vital to actually, I think, have a strong crossbench in both houses, the House of Reps and the Senate. Um, and even there are the great big examples like the Medivac legislation, but we have had small examples in this 46th Parliament um, where, for example, legislation that has been rammed through the House because the government has the numbers, they do have a majority. It's only a very slim majority, but it is still a majority. Uh, and in fact, on, on occasions where, you know, the only people really standing up to the bullying tactics have been the crossbench, but mm. then that legislation cannot become law because it cannot pass the Senate. Mm. So the failure to consult, to be collaborative by the government um, ends up meeting against a wall when it comes to the Senate because the independence in the Senate uphold some principles of needing to see that this legislation needs amendments or needs needs change. And so we've had already examples and the EPVC Act amendment was a classic example yes. where it is still stuck. You know, we tried, I tried to move amendments and consideration in detail. 
the coalition uh, suspended standing orders to not even let me move the amendments, use their numbers to gag the debate completely. But then they meet, it simply cannot progress in the Senate. Um, and then we saw, um, look, you know, during the, um, after the horrendous revelations from Brittany Higgins and the inquiry and the establishment of the Jenkins Review, um, there was negotiation around the legislation for Freedom of Information and the Archives Act around um, what would happen to uh, people participating in that inquiry. And yeah. for example, as an independent, I was contacted by a lot of ex-staffers who were really distressed at the legislation as it was then drafted. And I was able to then work with um, Simon Birmingham and the government to really bring forward those concerns. They were willing to work with me we, and we amended um, that legislation. The amendment, I had discussed it with the Senate and the crossbench senators. They supported the amendments. It went through the Senate and came back and went through the House. So your impact as an independent is not all, you know, it's great when it's the big ticket items of big legislation. But it's often in the much smaller things. It's the negotiations and the briefings you have with the ministers. It's the small tweaks and changes that may, you can negotiate to change legislation that will make a difference. And that happens a lot in the Senate. So yes. the crossbench in the Senate is very active in negotiating amendments because the government does not have a majority in the Senate. So for, to pass any legislation, the Morrison government has to always get on board at least the two One Nation senators and one of either Jackie, uh, Rex Sterling or uh, Rex um, Patrick or Sterling Griff. So there always has to be that element of negotiation. And I mm. think it's vital for democracy that mm. you actually have to negotiate, that you have to approach this in a collaborative way. So the independence in the Senate, can mm. I say, Kim, vitally, vitally important. Yeah, thank you. I think that is something that is um, a reality of our political landscape, landscape, that the government of the day rarely does have the majority so that the role of the independents complements what you've just been talking about in the Senate because of that particular influence that the independents can have. And I think not only in terms of the policy, but that point that you just made about the collaborative approach, that notion that you actually have to work with people to really work out what is the best policy outcome rather than the politics of it. Now, we're about halfway through our hour, and I feel that um, I should remind people the screen that the participants are looking at, I don't think is exactly the screen that the audience is looking at. And I believe that those of you, and I think there are three over 350 people in the room, I've just been told. So there's a wonderful response. And it's very exciting that, that there are so many of you who have responded to my announcement yesterday of wanting to be part of this independent um, uh, voice and independent group in Parliament. But there is should be, I think, at the bottom, the various ways that you can ask questions of us through my Twitter account, through my Instagram account, and through um, uh, my Facebook account. The Kim for Canberra team is out there managing that. I've got a, um, a, um, an iPad next to me ready to be sent those questions. So those of you who are interested in asking questions, please start putting them down so that we can save some time at the end to, to do that, to engage with you as an audience. And to also remind you now, of course, of the www.kimforcanberra.com dot com dot au to um, find out more about what I'm wanting to do but coming back to the point Zali that you just mentioned in terms of the Kate Jenkins review many of you may remember that um, I think it was last December after the first Four Corners um, uh, report I did actually have an opinion piece in the Canberra Times actually calling on the government to call on someone like Kate Jenkins to do a review of Parliament as a safe and equal workplace um, and then, of course, um, as you said, um, the astonishing, shocking revelations about um, Brittany Higgins' experience added without any doubt to the call that um, then led um, further to a further call from um, um, me and many others to ensure that Kate Jenkins' report um, Kate Jenkins will conduct that report. And so it is so heartening that there is an aspect of um, um, a response to, um, uh, to what has happened with that review. And we'll all, I think, look very eagerly to 
um, her report in um, later this year, I think October or November. But there are many people who have said to me, you know, why would you want to go into that house? What, why would you as a woman want to do that? And I wondered if you would each share some of your reflections. I'm sure you've been asked that question um, as well, but also your own experiences to the extent that you want to share of, of the nature of the workplace for women. And maybe Helen, why don't we start off um, with you on that one? Thanks, Kim. And, and it is a question I've been asked many times. And um, again, I can I can respond to it in a couple of ways. Uh, I think my experience of Parliament as an independent member of Parliament uh, gives me a different experience than perhaps um, members of Parliament who belong to a party. What I've observed is there um, are many cultures in the Australian Federal Parliament, actually. There's not just one. Um, and uh, what I see about the halls um, and uh, in my interactions with the staff of Parliament House is the most wonderful support and respect from um, the people who work in Parliament House, the security guards, the people who, who assist us in the library, uh, the people who assist us in the house, the, the sergeant at arms office, the transport people. Um, I, I have experienced the utmost respect and regard and assistance from those people. So when I first entered into the federal parliament, I was actually quite moved by the, the, uh, the respect and support I received from, from the staff of the house. So I want to stay, start by saying that. Mm. Um, and what I observe in the chamber is, is a lot of stuff and nonsense. And what I, you know, a term that I grew up with uh, that my mother often used to say was a, quite a lot of Tommy Rot. And, and I see a lot of Tommy Rot. And, and a lot of that is very blokey and a, very, and a lot of chest puffing and uh, feather flapping um, and, and alpha male behaviour. And, um, you know, it, it's actually quite boring and um, it doesn't progress decent debate uh, a lot of the time. And, of course, everyone who's on the line will observe question time and just, you know, what the heck is that about? Well, you know, that that's performative politics 101, essentially. So there's, there's the theatre of, of, uh, of the House, which I think is outdated and not effective and, uh, and as I said, frankly, quite boring. Um, there's also the behaviour in, uh, in the halls and in some of our committees, which again is dominated largely by men and uh, some of that kind of blokey back slapping stuff goes on there too. Um, and um, again, I find that at times rather ineffective and um, not the kind of committee work that I'm used to in my former life as, as, uh, as a nurse and as an academic um, and as a community member on not-for-profit boards. I've not seen such... Uh, such uh, uh, grandstanding often. Um, in terms of the really horrendous uh, sexual harassment that's been widely reported and, and, and frankly uh, appalls all of us, um, I have not been witness to that. Um, that. That in no way means it's not happening. And, and, I, and I know from what people have directly told me that 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 is happening and uh, that of course is unacceptable on every level and must stop. So again I would say um, there's a lot of intersections here and uh, and one of them of course is is gender. Uh, it's been widely discussed and, and it's clear when we don't have equal representation of men and women that there's an imbalance, a power imbalance and, and behaviours that go with that. But not only gender, it's also diversity more broadly. Um, we do not have enough people of colour. We do not have enough people of, of diverse uh, professional backgrounds. Um, there's a certain sameness, and um, that's that's to the loss of all Australians. Um, that means we don't have the kind of debate, the kind of collaboration and negotiation and public policy outcomes that we seek. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So Thanks, I suppose Helen. the other thing to say about that is um, I knew that before I, I entered Parliament. It's been widely discussed. It's been blown out of the water, of course, this year, which um, is has you know created the response we've just talked about with the Jenkins review and the marches and so on. Um, but I did know that before I came, and still I, I put my hand up to come to the Parliament. And of course, um, as I mentioned before, uh, the sister bill to my Integrity Commission bill is the Parliamentary Standards Bill. And again, that's building on the work of others and taking it forward still to say there are solutions to some of these things. Mm. 
Zali, um, yes. how's, what's your experience and perhaps comparing it to the world of sport and law? <laughs> Ah, uh, look, yeah, there is that fear of, oh, you know, the world of politics is dirty and nasty and it's, yes, it's misogynistic. I agree with everything Helen said, but for all the women out there that even ask that question, this is your house. This is the house of the people. This is your government. If it does not represent, it cannot represent you if you do not form part of it. Um, and so the only way it will change is by being in there even more. Um, all those, you know, that bad behaviour and culture is actually to <clears throat> intimidate people from joining and instead it should spur more people to come and be part of it and to change it um look I agree with with Helen in that I think as independent especially women we've come from careers we um are probably not we are not subject to the same treatment um I think uh, I have observed women within the major parties um I'd say mostly from the coalition side um, there is a lot more going on in terms of I think that kind of slightly pervasive intimidation from speaking up that you cannot um, speak out of school, you can't let down the team. When Julie Bishop talked about some of that mentality, I've certainly observed that. Um, the discussion and the speeches in the chamber certainly don't always reflect the private conversations you can have outside the chamber. So to me that shows there is a, a level of bullying and influence um, that's not healthy. I think the more, you know, you should be free to have your opinions. Um, but if compared to the world of sport or the world of, uh, of the bar, you know, sled, I mean, I think the biggest puff, chest puffing we see in chamber is the sledging, um, which ironically, you know, we I sort of had that at the bar, at the bar table, um, and you certainly have that in sport. So I was never intimidated by any of that. Um, uh, there is a sense of, um, you know, being a politician is being in the public eye. It is a life of public service. Um, and so with that comes a level of scrutiny and exposure. And so that is, I think, the part people need to get comfortable with. But the actual environment of Canberra, um, it is ultimately what you make it, how you shape it, what experience you want to have. Um, I think some of the behaviour has been appalling. And I, I will always remember coming out of the chamber uh, and discussing with Rebecca, Sharkey and Helen and our chiefs of staff, who are all three women, um, we were discussing these allegations and how they were profoundly um, upsetting, but also how much they showed the lack of resource and the lack of training and education and support systems that we had within the parliament. And even we as fairly educated and, you know, um, MPs and chiefs of staff did not have ready answers to how that situation should or could have been managed in the current framework. So it's an incredible privilege to be there now at a time where we can make a difference for women coming um, and to ensure that we have a safer workplace. This should be a gold standard place, workplace for Australia and it's probably the most unsafe workplace of Australia, which is crazy. Um, but we're all very committed to changing that. So, um, look, you know, the, the, there is, there's no prize for being uh, a passive bystander. Um, we have big issues, big challenges in our time um, and that will require participatory democracy. People need to get involved, whether it's as an MP or as a candidate or like you, Kim, uh, as a candidate for the Senate, or in supporting you and joining your team and being part of that. Because at the end of the day, uh, I'm a big believer that you won't get to um, later in life and look back and regret, the, regret being brave. You won't regret having a go, but you will always feel, you know, sorry for the opportunities you weren't brave enough to take. So very much encourage women to get involved. Terrific. With that inspirational call, Karen, what would you like to add from your experience in terms of gender issues in your time there? I think it's just wonderful listening to, to Helen and Zali just sum it up so well. I mean, from Helen talking about uh, how, how wonderfully supportive all of the staff who work in Parliament House are, uh, from the drivers who pick you up to all of the people who provide that support for parliamentarians who help you draft your legislation, who uh, provide you with, with documentation and historical context and uh, the security guards. 
absolutely uh, wonderful and supportive. And, uh, and as, as Zali pointed out, you know, the, 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 it can be uh, a, a, a brutal environment. Uh, and I think it really helps if you have uh, some life experience and, uh, and if you come with a, ba a background of professional experience that, so that you have uh, resilience that's built from that. And, uh, and so I think that's uh, really important to consider because it, it is a life of accountability and scrutiny and, uh, and that can be quite challenging too, to, to lose elements of, of your privacy. Yeah. Um, I became accustomed to, to this uh, when I was president of the AMA, to the rough yeah. and tumble of medical mm -hmm. politics, mm -hmm. uh, which intersects with uh, both mm -hmm. state and federal politics. And, uh, and, you know, that's not for the faint hearted. So you kind of learn how things work from coming from an advocacy background in that way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so going into federal parliament, I did have some understanding of, of what I was going into. And I think it's really important for women out there who are considering a, a role, uh, particularly as an MP or a senator, that you speak to people like Zali and Helen and myself. And, and, uh, and you know, I certainly spoke to Rebecca and to, to Rebecca Sharkey and to Kathy McGowan who reached out to me when I announced my candidacy initially, uh, just to ask those really important uh, detailed questions about, you know, how life is and how to build your uh, resilience and, uh, and, and how to cope with the various pressures. You know, there's no question that it is a very pressured job. You work really hard, you work long hours, you rely very much on the team around you and building that team around you is also a, a very important part of that resilience too. Uh, I think if we're talking about uh, the way uh, the brave women who have spoken out about their experience of Parliament, particularly in uh, working for the parties, uh, that, that those, their stories need to be respected, they need to be taken very seriously, and I don't think we can be satisfied with a yet another report uh, that goes nowhere. I think unless there is leadership on real action to change the workplace culture, and to, uh, to really uh, respect the stories of the brave women who have been prepared to speak out at great personal cost, then I think that we are letting down not only those women, not only the current and future women who are, are in Parliament House, who want to work in Parliament House, but honestly to, to send a signal to women everywhere that our Parliament will not put up with that kind of behaviour. Yeah. Well, I, I totally feel that that is one of the drivers for me in wanting to be in there when Kate Jenkins' report comes down to be able to have some influence in making sure that um, those um, recommendations um, are properly engaged with and are really closely. There's so many reports I'm, I'm aware of that I've submitted to where there are wonderful recommendations and then they sit and they sit and they sit. I mean, the, her respect at work report which um, was uh, handed down in March of 2020 and admittedly just as the pandemic came in but it took until all of these events occurred and and still even more time before the government actually referred to and engaged with those respective work issues and um, I certainly would be passionate if I get there to be making sure that there is immediate action on what comes from her from her report. Look, I've, I've got one more question before. I've got a, a series of questions here and I'm, I'm looking, we've got 12 minutes left. The one um, which is more about campaigning, I guess, and um, we don't know when the election is going to be held. We know it has to be sometime before May. But many people have said to me, but it's nearly impossible for an independent to win. And I'm really curious to know, um, what do you think was significant in making it possible for each of you um, when I'm sure, no doubt, you were each also told that it would be almost impossible um, to win. What do you think there was about the time for you and maybe about this current period that um, perhaps keeps me optimistic in thinking through the road ahead of me? What, what are the significant things also for all the 350 or so of us participating in this now to think about, to energise people around us, to, to get people... Um, like us, um, either back in at the next election or someone like me in. Um, who would like to start that off? Um, Sally, why don't you start that off? Uh, sure. Well, I look, obviously, 
Uh, look, Tony Abbott was certainly a, um, you know, a very exper experienced, wily politician. He had, you know, been there for a long time and a lot did not think it was possible to um, defeat him. Um, I viewed it differently. I felt there was certainly uh, momentum in terms of dissatisfaction from our community's point of view that he was really... Um, focused on his own ambition and political goals rather than representing the electorate on a number of issues. Uh, climate had been one of them, staying on after losing the prime ministership, and so being, you know, losing that leadership. Um, uh, the uh, same-sex marriage vote was a huge impact on our community, his failure to represent the majority views of the electorate. Um, and just an, a really an unwillingness to be accountable to the electorate and available to the electorate. So I definitely felt that there was absolutely the opportunity to do it. But again, you can't be passive. None of this happens by chance or by accident. It happens by design, by good planning and a lot of hard work. Um, we had a four and a half to five month campaign. It was 100% of my time. I was out there seven days a week. I had volunteers that put in thousands of hours. Like the teamwork that went into the campaign is unbelievable. But it, it had a momentum because it came from the community that a major party simply cannot match. Um, it is locals talking to locals on their street corner about the issues that matter to them. And that is incredibly powerful. And that's what all independent campaigns, I think, are about and what you have to do. Um, and at the end of the day, from a re-election point of view for Helen and I, it's going to be a question of our accountability to our electorate. And I know how hard we've been working at delivering for our electorates um, and we you know I certainly will feel proud to stand back before the people of Oringa very clearly with what I've worked on how I've communicated but from your point of view Kim it's really important to you've got time you know there is a certain amount of time before the election it's incredibly important that everybody reach out to their network if every person reaches out to everyone in their network and encourages them to reach out even further that's how you grow a movement and word of mouth. You need people and you need to explain that, you know, people are busy in their lives. Yeah. Um, politics is not everybody's, you know, burning passion, um, but it's important to have the conversation so people can understand what are the issues, what you stand for, what your processes will be so that you are front of mind when they are at the ballot box. Fantastic. Thank you. Helen, why don't we go to you next on that? Thanks, Kim. And uh, look, I echo a lot of what Zali has said, but um, coming coming from Indi, we had a template for how to do it. Um, we had to learn how to campaign. And uh, I, I absolutely concur that none of this happens by chance. It happens by a very professional, careful design and enormous commitment from the people who are backing you. And, um, you know, I describe myself as a community independent and uh for me, I'm the front person of a, of a great big movement, but a movement that's not a party. So um, this is really about having a key team that are expert in logistics, that have the smarts on, on, on how digital campaigning works, who understand uh, campaign finance, uh, who understand uh, marketing and advertising. All those things have got to be there. Uh, and they've got to be there layered upon a big movement of people who can um, spread the word, as Zali said, who can give those personal testimonials. Um, you know, we, we use Bush Telegraph enormously across India. It's amazing, amazing when the, you know, when the chat starts and who knows who. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have phone trees, we have letter drops, we have get togethers. We have a lot of fun. Um, we try to make it fun. We try to take out, uh, take out the, the stuff that people hate about politics, which is the nasty stuff. And uh, certainly in, in Indi, one of the things that we've found engages people to jump on board and take part is to say, we'll never say anything nasty about other candidates. Um, we will not engage in that kind of politics, that we come with solutions, um, that we try to be our best selves and um, and and we get in there and, and, uh, and participate. You know, the world's run by those who turn up is the old saying. Um, so I think there's all of those things, but I, I think um, certainly in my case, uh, I had no profile. 
um, outside of my own professional networks. And um, what Indi, I guess, had seen was that an independent can work, uh, that, that that experiment uh, was one that was worth taking and people wanted more of that. So for us, we very much had a view that um, ours is not a seat for the taking, ours is a seat for the giving. And um, we, again, try to bring forward a very positive way of campaigning. So I really encourage, uh, encourage anyone who's running for parliament to be positive, to be really mm. positive. Yeah. I don't underestimate, though, that there's some differences in trying to run for the Senate uh, compared to running for the, for the House. And there's differences between city electorates and, and rural electorates. And there's differences when you're trying to slay a dragon um, or when you're running against someone who maybe looks a bit like you. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, Definitely. again, I would underscore that it's an enormous amount of work. Uh, it takes a lot of organisation and planning and it's totally worth it. Wonderful. Karen, uh, last bit from you before I take a couple of the questions that have come in. Now, Kim, uh, you would be aware more than anybody that uh, that Canberra and the ACT more broadly is a political town. Mm -hmm. People are politically engaged. They live and breathe the politics. And uh, and what I sense, uh, not only from, from people I know in Canberra, but from broadly around the nation, is that, that people want to see change. They are frustrated with politics as usual. They want to see something new, something different, something refreshing independence provide the promise of that new form of politics, which is community engaged, which is not beholden to party politics, which has the community and the community's well-being at its core. And one of my favourite philosophies is that if you want something to change, you have to change something. And what we can change is to have strong cross benches in the yeah. Senate and in the House of Representatives with representatives like Zali, like Helen, like yourself, really representing their community, bringing their life experience, their professional experience, their intelligence, their expertise, their passion, and the, uh, the uh, imprimatur of their communities. And you know, I think what, what independents also provide is the promise that we don't just have to accept that the party political game that has been played uh, and imposed on the Australian people for such a long time now, which is not serving us well, that we don't have to accept that it just has to continue. We can, through our votes, through our communities, putting forward credible, intelligent, community-based independence, we can change the face of Australian politics in this country. And this next election is the opportunity to do that. Look, that is um, a wonderful start to or a answer to the first question that came in from Cathy Ross, which was why work outside of a party if the party holds so much dominance? Why not transform the party? Would that have more impact and change politics? And perhaps I'll respond to Cathy in terms of people asking me why not just join a party? And I think part of your answer is, is the answer to that, Karen, which is that of course, there are a place for parties, but I think at the moment within our political framework, parties are the stumbling block rather than the opportunity for change. And I agree that parties need to change, but I have the sense that the moment is now for independence to assist with that. So not only would independence have the capacity to do what we just discussed earlier, but I think it will raise the bar within parties. I, I, what I feel like I'm gonna be doing is bringing out the best of parties rather than the worst. The moment we're seeing the worst and independence will not only influence parliament itself, but I think in, in the independents have the capacity to help the parties improve themselves. So that would be, that's my, my own personal answer. And given we've got limited time, I might just go through to the next one. One of the questioners asks about, should we be focusing on greater voting literacy, given that preferential voting is so under, underappreciated and undervalued and that people simply vote major parties, yet the system allows us to vote for smaller parties. And that might be a segue actually, that's um, an, an, I think it's Anthea's um, question. That might be a segue to me explaining why I've joined, formed the Kim for Canberra party. And that's the difference of the Senate in relation to your experiences in the house. With the above and below the voting um, ballot paper for the Senate, there is um, just undoubtable research and outcome that if you are below the line or if you're an independent group above the line, you have less chance of attracting 
voters' knowledge and understanding of how the voting system works. So my Kim for Canberra party is really to put me on an even footing in, in the practical framework of the parties to have a go of having someone as fiercely independent as me having a real chance um, in there. And so to that end, that's also a plug to say that I want you to go to the Kim for canberra.com.au website to join the party. At the moment, the Electoral Act requires 500 members for me to register, and then it takes 12 weeks before the Commission will process that to enable me to be above the line. I say at the moment because there's amen an amendment um, bill in Parliament, as uh, Zali and Helen will know, saying that not that you will need 1,500 members to be a member, to be a party, to be registered with the Commission. And that's why I've put out a call for 1,500 members so that I've got that ready in the event that that, um, that legislation passes. But as soon as I've got my 500 members, and I can say as from today that we've We've already, I think, um, had a significant uh, couple of days with well over 100 people who have joined, but I want to get to that 500. And so uh, to remind everyone that even though I'm going to be representing the ACT or wanting to in the, in the Senate, to be a, a member of a party, all you need to be is on the electoral roll anywhere in Australia and not already a member of um, another party. So anyone in the country can assist me in making sure that I'm on a level, level playing field. And of course, I'll be representing the ACT and wanting to engage with the community, but the issues that I'll be dealing with in parliament will have an impact on the whole nation. So extra incentive for you to, to join, even if you can't actually vote for me in Canberra on the day. One of the last questions, because we're really um, close to the end of time, that I wanted to highlight is a question from Sibella Stern. Um, Sibella's response was, it seems like independence focus largely on local and domestic issues. Is there room to engage on foreign policy in Australia's place in the world? Maybe that might be a nice place to get a final comment from, from each of you before I sum up. So, Zali, do you want to start us off on that? Um well, look, it's an interesting take, as I would beg to disagree. Look, I think um, it's in particular when it comes to climate policy, Indeed. that is very much an international policy and that is um, <clears throat> how we are viewed by our trading partners, <coughs> excuse me, and will profoundly impact a lot of things. And look, there's a, my experience would say that um, people don't always completely appreciate the distinction between local government, state, politics and federal politics. There is a blurring of the lines of responsibilities. Um, and I think in the lower house, so as an MP, um, yes, we are there to look at national issues. International, um, yes, to an extent. But again, I don't view that as an independent. I'm not going out to rewrite our defence force, you know, our defence policy or our national security. Um, but I do scrutinise very much legislation and policy to make sure it's merit based, that it's factual, and that it is sound. Um, and we certainly have that opportunity um, to get the briefings and to ask the questions and to raise the concerns of our constituents. I think it's really important to remember this is the House of Representatives and you're representing your electorate. So it's interesting, I, I wouldn't view representing those issues that matter to your electorate is not just a question of being local localized it's actually yes. these are the issues that matter to the electorate yeah fabulous karen what do you what would your response be to that well my response would be that uh, independents are there to represent their electorate but they are there to represent their electorate on every piece of legislation that comes before the house or the senate and so uh, it, it, you, you may not uh, be putting forward legislation or amendments on every piece of legislation, which includes those to do with uh, foreign policy and, and defence and, and uh, trade, but you certainly will be needing to have an opinion on it and you'll be asked by the media about how you might vote on a piece of uh, particularly more contentious legislation. And, uh, and, and so you, you have to, as an independent, have a sense of what your community thinks. Because if you're a member of a party, you get just get told how to vote. You don't even have to think about the legislation. You might take an interest in one piece of legislation over another or one area of legislation uh, more, more than something else if you're a member of a party. But um, 
with an independent, you have to be able to justify every one of your votes because you are you will be voting. You may vote most of the time to support government legislation, but there will be times where you want to amend that legislation or change it in the interest not only of your community but of your country. Wonderful, Helen. Over to you. Look, I think what I would add to this is that we focus very much on our parliamentary work, but the work of a Member of Parliament or a Senator goes beyond what we do in the House. And uh, we have many opportunities to engage with our community on the ground, uh, to be good leaders, to introduce our communities to some of the national issues that we may be debating. Um, we write to ministers, we take meetings with ministers, uh, we work on committees, we have lots of opportunities to influence in some ways on, on uh, international policy. Uh, so I think perhaps where, uh, where our influence would be is not as visible as uh, it would be perhaps if you were a member of the government. Mm. And I think it's probably a sobering question to fi finalise our evening in thinking of Australia's place in the world, really where I began tonight in terms of the pandemic. The pandemic is such a reminder, isn't it, that we're all so interconnected and Australia's place in the world is so fundamentally connected to the rest of the world. And I really do reach out, as many of you know, to all those Australian citizens who are stuck outside of Australia because of a government that didn't act quickly enough in order to ensure that Australians, wherever they are in the world, have their government acting in as much as as much as they can to do what they can for the best interests of Australians wherever they are. And I think, as I said it before, in terms of Afghanistan and foreign policy, I think whoever is an active citizen within their own country, you know, has just been so blown away by the awfulness um, of um, and the impact of foreign policy that, um, you know, affects all of us as human beings. So. Sibella, that's, I think, a very powerful question to end on. But I think, I hope that 350 of you in this Zoom world that we're experiencing at the moment, which, of course, knows no borders whatsoever as we connect wherever we are, um, is um, a, 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 a sense of hope for the future because I certainly um, want to reinforce to each of you, Zali, Karen and Helen, what an inspiration you've been to me in the step that I'm now taking, but I think an inspiration to so many Australians in terms of the importance of active citizenship, the importance of standing up and doing something um, for our community. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you to each of you for that. Thank you to each of you for joining me um, the day after my announcement and showing that um, sisterhood support. I really have to shout out that we did not discuss what we were wearing tonight and I can't believe how fantastic the color coordination is. But I think okay. it's a metaphor for just that sisterhood, but that sisterhood that is not only a sisterhood, but a humanhood that we really do all want to make sure that all people in this world can live in a better world. And um, I thank you all for their, your roles and I hope I can be a participant in the way you have in the future. And that probably is the point that I reach out to the 350 of you one last time and say, go to www.kimforcanberra.com.au. Have a look at what I'm offering um, to all of the Australians in the room in terms of registering to be a party. But of course, to the Canberrans, I'll be reaching out of you to engage with you. Those messages from Zali and Helen and Karen about engaging with your community, what I'm trying to start up and you'll hear more from me as you sign up and um, and I'll get out as far and wide to hear from the Canberra community but also on behalf of all the strands to do what I can do if if I can in that context in parliament and with that it is um, unfortunately I've gone over I've not been true to the time but it was just so engaging and I hope you've all been able to stay on it's now 908 so thank you very much for your hour and almost 10 minutes with us tonight Stay safe, everybody. Look after yourselves. Look after your families. Look after our community. And I look forward to seeing you again. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Kim. Thank you.